And in the fourth stage, once the government's made the law, it has to actually apply the law, right? So it needs the help of people like civil servants or police people or the, the legal system to make sure that the laws that it creates actually get followed. It needs your help too. People actually have to follow the law as well, right? So Rawls' argument here is that in the third and the fourth stage, those are the most likely places where injustices go to occur. Right? Um, either the government makes an unjust law or two here and there, based on an otherwise valid society, you know, it will make one or two incorrect laws, or the government makes correct laws and then the people who implement the laws are bad. So let's say there's a corrupt police force or a lazy or corrupt civil service or something like that, right? So the third and the fourth stage tends to be where injustice happens, right? So Rawls' theory says that people in the original position, you know, is perfectly just society, are going to choose some form of democracy. They're going to choose some sort of majority rule. And the problem with this is that there's a big contradiction, right? Majority rule, on the one hand, is one of his principles of justice. And on the other hand, majority rule sometimes generates unjust laws. So how can it be fully just and create an injustice at the same time, right? Rawls says that democratic society would collapse if everybody protested at the same time. And he says that, well, our societies are really perfect. And in fact, there's many things that we disagree with all the time. You, know, you can probably think of like 50 things about the society we don't like right now. From the smallest, stupidest thing to the biggest, most serious thing. And if we protested about every single thing, like we followed Thoreau's argument, we've got a moral duty to protest against everything that's wrong. But if we did that, We'd spend most of our life protesting and none of our life doing anything else. Okay? So, therefore, Rawls' point is that we have to determine what types of laws do we actually have a requirement, a moral requirement, to resist. Right? Is it everything? No. Uh, then what? How do we make a decision about the things we're going to protest and the things we're going to leave alone? Um, now, Rawls' argument then is that if a group finds themselves habitually the victims of injustice, this is a major reason that they have a strong moral claim to break the law. You know, so specifically, the, the context that Rawls was talking about was racial injustice against African Americans in the United States. It's like, okay, that's an example of a group of people who are always the victims of injustice in that specific context. Right? They're, they're habitually, normally, the ones who are suffering unjust, unjust treatment. Yeah, because they're the ones who are normally suffering unjust treatment, Rawls thinks, well, that's a clear example of a group of people who are morally justified in breaking the law, right, to, to sort of get this injustice remedy. So Rawls' conditions for civil disobedience are the following. Um, firstly, the injustice must be clear. So in order for it to be clear, the first thing we need is principles. If we don't have principles of justice, we can't complain when things happen to us that we don't like, right? That's one really solid reason why you should believe in things. Decide what you think is fair about the world. Because if you don't care about anything, people can literally do anything to you that they want. And you have no way of arguing against it. You must care about stuff, otherwise you have no right to complain. Okay, so um, the principle of equal liberty for roles is a very obvious principle. For example, Let's say we deny all women the right to vote again. We sort of go back to the past century and say only men are going to do, sorry, the past two centuries. Uh, only men are going to vote, women aren't, right? That's a very clear case of taking political rights away from one major group of people, right? So, whereas if we look at economic inequality, for example, um, Rawls argues that there's lots of reasons for economic equality, right? Some people are just lazy, some people are stupid, some people make bad decisions. Some people are the victims of capitalist exploitation because they don't have the means of production. Yeah, there's the Marxist in me jumping out. Um, so there's lots of reasons why some people are poor. It's a much more murkier area. We don't know exactly why they're poor. They're probably poor because of all of those things or some combination of them. Right? Whereas if people don't have political rights, it's because people have not given them political rights. It's a very clear-cut reason. You know, there's a group of people have some group have decided that they're not as important as others in society. And so we're not giving them rights for that reason. Right. Secondly, Rawls argues that civil disobedience has to break the law, not just test it. 
you know, um, when new laws get made by government, the favorite thing that like activists and lawyers and all sorts of interested groups like to do is test the limits of the law, you know, see how much they can push it before they break it, and see how much is now legal, right? This isn't civil disobedience. Uh, for all, civil disobedience must break the law, like, uh, not, not just test the limits of it. And then Rawls says that we have to break the law that we're opposing. So many people who engage in civil disobedience will try and break all kinds of laws um, as a way of highlighting the protest, I guess. Like, for example, um, during the Quit India movement, uh, in the Indian independence movement, um, they just broke every single law to deliberately try and get arrested. Right? Why did they do that? Because they knew if they got arrested, then the jails would fill up with people and there's no way the justice system could cope with everybody being in jail at the same time, right? So it's a deliberate strategy to weaken the state. Okay, now, Rawls says this is wrong from a moral standpoint in a partially just society. You know, we should specifically protest against the law that we're breaking. So the, the law that we're protesting against, that's the law that we've got to break. So for example, if the government says that they want to build a road through a house, you know, we can blockade that road. We can occupy the construction site. We can do whatever because we're protesting against the specific law that we're breaking, right? Um, whereas if the government's going to build a road through our house, so we go and blockade the parliament building, Rawls would say that's not justified, right? We're breaking a different law than the one that we're protesting. Next, civil disobedience must be a public act. Rawls argues that the most important part of civil disobedience is that we're trying to communicate our politics to the government. You know, we're trying to change people's mind. We're not just resisting for nothing. You know, we're trying to change the people who, who have power, change their decision. Right? So um, this involves being civilly disobedient while appealing to the majority. So for example, if you don't like the Macau government or you don't like some policy that they're making, and so you say, oh, I know, I'm going to like not pay tax next year. I'll find some way of hiding my money and hiding my income. And yeah, I'll keep the money to myself. But I won't tell anybody. I'll keep that to myself. Okay? That is not civil disobedience. Why? Because you're not communicating your protest, right? You're not trying to change anybody's opinion. You know, you're just taking the money and making yourself richer. Right? So it's not a public act. Next, civil disobedience should be non-violent and non-threatening. Right? So the Rawls concept of civil disobedience is non-violent um, based on the idea that those people participating in this civilly disobedient behavior want the right changes for the right reason, not because they force the government into a change. So it's important to distinguish here between moral persuasion and the use of force. Right? This theory strongly emphasizes moral persuasion as being better than the use of force. Right? And lastly, we have accepting the penalty. So the civilly disobedient must accept the penalty for breaking the law, right? And the reason for this is like, if you escape the penalty, what you're actually doing, again, is challenging the state's power. If you break the law and try to avoid punishment, you're challenging the state's power, saying I can do what I want and you can't stop me, right? Part of civil disobedience involves communicating your protest to the government, you know, that means being prepared to pay the punishment for this protest. Right? So this is kind of what Thoreau did by saying, okay, I'm not going to pay my taxes, but I'm not going to not pay my taxes and then run. I'm going to not pay my taxes and deliberately get arrested. Because by getting arrested, that shows everybody how much immorality I think is going on, about how immoral the system is and how immoral the law is and you know why the government should change its mind. Right? So, we need to deliberately break the law as part of the civil disobedience, but then not escape the punishment. We can't challenge the state. Right, Rawls thinks we have to not threaten the politically um, the, the stability of the political system. Um, as I've said, that there's lots of groups in any society that probably feel upset about something. Right, they probably feel justified that there is at least one thing that they could be protesting about today. Right, um, but. If everybody protests about all of their issues at the same time, Rawls argues that the whole social system would break down, right? Everybody would be protesting, nobody would be doing anything, this, the whole society would collapse. Which leads to an important problem. Um, how do we decide whose issue is the most important issue? 
today at this point, right? Who has the right to protest and who doesn't? Right? If you agree that everybody should take turns, whose turn is it and when? Right? Whose issue is the most important? Okay, and lastly, we have civil disobedience is based on the faithfulness to the law. Right? So people who believe in this method tend to believe that the system is generally good, or at least generally okay. And that civil disobedience is about fixing or repairing it, not completely breaking it down or destroying the existing social and political system. And it's this overall commitment to the law that justifies the protests against the unjust laws. You know, they take the position that I would never break the law except that this law is highly immoral, therefore I'm breaking it, right? Rather than a person who always breaks the law. If they break a new law, it's not really that big a deal. You know, they always break the law anyway. Okay, so um, some people have criticized rules for narrowing the concept of civil disobedience significantly, right? One strategy that people who um, protesters use is what we call inconveniencing. So civil disobedience can also be used to make laws unworkable. You know, I gave the example of the Indian independence movement where activists deliberately got arrested in order to slow down the justice system. Right? Now Rawls would say that's wrong, um, that, that you can't target the justice system as a whole just because you don't like specific aspects of a law. Right? So if a large people, group of people deliberately get arrested, this can nonetheless have a very important impact, right? Now, the, the, that, had, that had a very significant impact on decisions that the British government made in the, the British colony of India at the time, right? So, um, Rawls' biggest problem with this is that you're not making a moral appeal to the majority. You're not trying to convince them. You're using a kind of force, right? It's not violent force. You're not shooting anybody or killing anybody. But it's force in the sense that the state will not function properly if everybody gets arrested. So you're sort of compelling the state to make different decisions, right? Against this is the fact that historically this has been a highly effective tactic that's worked in lots of different places. Right, so secondly, the problem is that we often live in piecewise just societies. In other words, societies that are not completely just and societies where it takes time and effort and pressure to convince people of different opinions than what they currently hold. Right? To change people's mind is not an instant thing. You know, just because you tell something, somebody something's wrong, or something's offensive, or something's bad, and it should be changed, right? Doesn't mean they're immediately going to change their opinion, right? So it takes time. Now the question then is, is that well, Rawls places a lot of emphasis on communicating to the majority, but the majority might not listen to you initially. Especially, they might not listen to you um, if they're very convinced that they're correct. You know, if they're very convinced that the minority is wrong. Right? So, therefore, civil disobedience um, can be used as a way of amplifying this convincing strategy. So, how do we convince people that we really, really care about this issue? You know, and that people should really, really listen to us. Right? Is to protest about it over a long period. So exactly what Rawls is saying is not justified. Could be the exact thing that helps us convince people to change their mind over time. And then we have civil courage. So Rawls says that civil disobedience is only possible in almost just societies. So societies that are mostly just and just have a little bit of injustice. Which raises a big question. Um, in an unjust society, you know, like a military dictatorship or something like that, um, can you do civil disobedience? You know, can you break the law for moral reasons in a non-violent way to change law or government policy? Now, Rawls' theory seems to commit us to the point that no, we can't. Right? Civil disobedience only works if the society believes itself to be just. Yeah, because then we're using their own ideas against them and convincing them they should live up to their own ideas. Right? Now, some people have a problem with this because what it really suggests is that if you live in an unjust society, you live in a society where the leaders just do whatever they want and don't care and don't even try to be fair, that you have no other option other than political violence if you want to change what they're doing. Right? If the leaders have no principles of justice, role civil, disobe uh, civil disobedience doesn't work at all because the whole concept is based on the leaders having some sort of moral compass. Right? If they have no moral compass, their moral persuasion is not going to work. 
So does that theory then commit everybody to political violence in unjust societies? Okay, so in summary, um, civil disobedience is the non-violent and morally justified breaking of the law, right? It's different from criminal behavior. It's moral, moral law breaking, I suppose. Um, we've looked at different arguments for and against civil disobedience today, and what we've seen is that um, civil disobedience justifies itself by saying, well, if the law is unjust, then it's just not to follow the law. That's the basics of the argument. Um, here we've said that in democratic societies, some people will argue that the law is just as long as it's democratically agreed upon. Okay, that, that the fact that most people agree with something gives it greater legitimacy. That democracy itself gives the law greater legitimacy. And therefore, it's important not to break the law just because you disagree with it. Right? So civil disobedience movements appear to have been limited successes when right? we look at the places where they happen. Right? It's notable they've only been successful when there has been the potential for violence at the same time. Right? So the civil disobedience movement was successful in India perhaps because the alternative was a violent revolution. Right? And the people in power probably preferred non-violent protest to violent revolution. Um, it, was, it was successful in the United States civil rights movement because, again, the alternative was violent revolution. You know, there were other groups of Black Panthers or Malcolm X or those sort of politics in the United States that supported violent insurrectionary movements. You know, perhaps the argument can be made that those people in power preferred civil disobedience to violent revolution. And that they, the only time civil disobedience has credibility is when there's a worse, more dangerous alternative at play. Right, so, um, at the same time, civil disobedience has generally not been successful in one of their ultimate aims. That is, changing the attitudes of the oppressors. Right? If the whole thing is based on convincing the people in power that they're wrong, and convincing those people to change their mind based on their own ideas, then we can say that civil disobedience movements have probably never been successful. You know, the British left India not because they realized that imperialism was wrong. Um, they left because they couldn't govern anymore. You know, they were basically forced out. Okay. Um, civil rights were granted to you know, people in the United States, African Americans in the United States, arguably not because everybody realized that racism was wrong. That racism still exists. Right? So it's clear that the whole society hasn't just given up on racist ideas. Right? Maybe the argument is that civil rights were granted because, um, you know, in a lot of ways, they were forced to do that. You know, through boycotts and protests and civil unrest, you know, compelled the government to extend civil rights to the whole population. Right? So in other words, the force aspect of protest seems to be more dominant than the moral persuasion aspect. All right, so that's it for civil disobedience. Um, so the things I have to remind you about is the essay is now due in one week. Do not forget.